Good morning. Uh, welcome to the one of my favorite days of the year, start of March Madness. <laughs> so let's, let's start off with a happy note. Um, it is Thursday, March 16th, and uh, just after 9.30, and this is the Education and Culture Committee. Uh, we're going to take up some items related to the capital improvement plan, our capital budget. Uh, and the first on the agenda is uh, our great folks at Montgomery College, and we're joined I see by Dr. Williams, uh, Ms. Schramm, and Ms. Knight, and we also, I also see Ms. Colette here, so good to see you, sir, and obviously our wonderful council staff. Um, and so we, the, the goal here is we're going to review and make some recommendations on some uh, recommended cuts. Uh, uh, there, obviously, yesterday we had some, some news in that we received the budget, uh, operating budget from the county executive, uh, which as part of that massive package included some uh, adjustments to recordation tax revenues and other things that will create some potential other actions we have to take but w that we will not take today we will deal with what was before us uh, yesterday and uh, but just wanted to allude to that so uh, I'll turn to staff to tee us up and then if Dr. Williams if you want to make any opening comments after that that'd be great Thank you very much. So I'm Craig Howard, and with me is Nazifa Hussain. And so today what we'll do is kind of walk through the um, college's uh, recommended capital budget request, amendment request, and, and the county executive's recommendations, which, as you mentioned, the ones that came over on January 15th. Um, there's six different projects that we'll go through. Uh, Ms. Hussain will do an overview of the request and go through the first four projects. Um, then I'll go through the last two projects, and at the end of each project, we'll, we'll pause to allow the committee to make a, um, a decision on each individual project. Um, most of the college projects this year are, are very straightforward, or much more straightforward than they've been in past years, which which is nice. Um, and then, but there is the the issue that we'll take up towards the end of um, some of the non-recommended reductions. Um, so with that, we'll yep. Dr. Williams wants to before make we do that. Do you have anything you would like to say? You just want to go right in. Dr. I thank you, thank you very much, Chairman Jawando. Yes, if I I appreciate the opportunity just to share for a few minutes in the the first meeting um, that we're having with with your committee. Oh, so that's right. Yeah, that's so fair. I just want to kind of um, just share a little bit. I will be I, I I will be brief, but I just want to kind of um, you know uh, level set in terms of you know your community's college and share some things that that we're doing as you know we have our, our three campuses and we're working hard on on the fourth campus from you know Whitman the Wheaton we're serving students from every MCPS high school and even 50% of all the students who stay in state after their 12th grade year who attend college they attend uh, Montgomery College so we're really proud about that um, so we're about 40,000 students a year we're federally designated as a Hispanic serving institution and an Asian American, Native American, Pacific Islander serving institution. Um, about 80% of our students identify themselves as a person of color. We had a 10% uh, increase in our first time ever in college population in fall 2022. So I know enrollment is always a question and that was an increase. I wanted to share that um, today. Uh, we also, for the first time in 10 years, spring over spring saw an increase in our spring 23 population by looking at spring 23 to spring 22 last time that happened was about 10 years ago so so we're doing we're doing a lot um we're data informed and we rely on our on our partnerships so while we offer 144 degrees um, we're also strategically allocating resources where they need in order to fuel our economy in nursing and healthcare in IT and cybersecurity and in, in education um, where we're looking at enhancing the number of seats that we have in our nursing program. The, the council along with our, our state delegation and others really helped us achieve an earmark uh, uh, for enhancing our nursing program as well. Nexus Montgomery is a big, a big component of that. So I just wanted to share a, a few pieces. Um, you know, when we look at IT and you know, the 770 students in our cybersecurity program that are job ready from, from day one, our center of academic excellence and computer defense, it's, it's been designated by the NSA and Homeland Security. So as, as we share and we think about all the things that Montgomery College is doing, 
you know, including engaging eighth graders in our summer coding camps. Um, just wanted to really express our thanks, our gratitude, our excitement, our energy about building on our, our current successes. Um, you know the capital plans that are here before you. Um, you're aware of the, the $6 million cut that we're, we have that has been figured out and we're looking forward to continuing conversations so that we can uh, maintain and really keep a very much needed uh, Germantown Student Services building and, and library there. This capital um, funds that are there before you, as you know, really revolve around our libraries. And our campuses are, are immense. They serve thousands of students and each and every one of those students need modern libraries um, for textbooks that they can't afford that we buy for them for quiet spaces that they don't have in their in their lives in their homes for some of them for our residents who are filling out the application and need access um, to to the internet uh, and 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 so much more so I know that everyone up there I know you get it I would also be remiss if I didn't spend you know three and a half or four minutes just um, sharing some of the things that we're doing, communicating our appreciation for, for your support and really e expressing the need to have your continued support to move projects forward that are essential to you know, fuel our economy, creating that local talent pipeline. So thank you, Chairman. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Williams, and I appreciate uh, that overview and that's, that's great news about enrollment. Um, and you are always, in my time on the ENC right. committee, have been the college has always been the easiest parts of the conversation. So uh, we love all of our folks at MCPS, but you and as well, uh, and they're going to make it easy for me today too, hopefully. Um, but no, in all seriousness, uh, appreciate your willingness to work through these cuts uh, that were proposed, these non-recommended cuts, and, and make the numbers work, and all the work that you're doing. Uh, it, it, it's uh, noticed, and I think there's not a week goes by that one of my colleagues or I is not on a Montgomery College campus for some event. I, 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 we should probably track that. I bet you that's true. Um, I know I was on, on it over the weekend. So um, colleagues, do you have anything at this point? Okay. So we'll jump in. Mr. Howard. Um. All right. Thank you, Dr. Williams and Mr. Howard. As shared, I am Nazifa Hossein. I'm one of the year-long uh, yes, um, year fellows with the council, and I'll be starting us off. I'll begin with sharing an overview of the college's request. So Montgomery College's FY23 to 28 approved CIP total to 335 point million for the six year period. The college's request total for the amended FY23 to 28 CIP is 419.3 million, which is an 83.5 million increase over the six year period. A few key changes requested by the college include one, the college-wide library renovations project, an additional 6.4 million was requested due to state allowable cost escalation increases and unprecedented cost escalation due to supply chain shortages. The 6.4 million would be split half and half by the county and the state. Next, we have the Germantown Student Services Project. An additional 9.1 million was requested due to, again, the state allowable cost escalation increases. The 9.1 million would be split half and half by the county and the state. Then we have the East County Campus Project. An additional 60 million was requested for the design and construction of, of a fourth campus. And then we have the Rockville Theater Arts Building renovation. It's a new project. 8 million in funding was requested for FY27 and 71 million in the beyond six year period. Moving on to a summary of the county executive's recommendations. The executive recommendation for the amended FY23 to 28 CIP is 345.3 million for the college, which is an increase of 9.5 million over the approved CIP total and $74 million below the college's request. The executive provides recommendations for not funding two projects requested by the college. They are the East County Campus and the Rockville Theater Arts Building renovation because they do not meet the biannual CIP amendment criteria. And lastly, the College Affordability Reconciliation Project. 
the executive included a recommended affordability reduction to the college to the college with a total of six million in geo bonds and on February 27 chair Jawando had sent a letter requesting the college provide to pre, had re requested a letter excuse me had sent a letter requesting the college provide the committee with a proposed set of non recommended reductions that would meet the executive's recommendation and I will be moving on to individual projects for discussion so first we'll start off with the college-wide library renovations this project provides funding for the renovation of libraries on two of Montgomery College's campuses, the Rockville Macklin Tower Building and the Tacoma Park Silver Spring Resource Center. For this project, the college is requesting a total increase of about 64.0 million. This increase is based on a state allowable cost escalation increase of 9% and increases due to supply chain shortages. 3.5 million is requested in FY24 for the Tacoma Park Silver Spring Center, and about 2.9 million is requested for the Rockville Library renovation over FY25 and FY26. Both projects are funded half and half by the county and the state. The increase is split evenly, 3.19 million between geo bonds and state aid. The executive recommends approving this request, and council staff recommend moving forward with. Thank you. Let's pause there. Um, we'll take these up as was recommended separately. Uh, I know Councilmember Albernaz has a comment on this item. Uh, it's actually more of a broader point, um, but didn't quite know where to make it. But uh, and uh, we had a conversation about this recently in a Zoom uh, with Dr. Williams. But there, uh, now that federal earmarks are back open, uh, and Dr. Jill Biden's emphasis on community colleges and libraries in particular. Um, and now that the county has a new contract in place with a, uh, an organization who's helping us better track federal funds or aggressively go after those federal funds, um, I think it would make a lot of sense for us to put this on the list of an item that we uh, seek within the Department, U.S. Department of Education's budget and see if there are grants that are out there that we may be able to pursue. Um, because of Montgomery College's outstanding reputation and because of the great work that they are doing. And I very much agree with the emphasis on libraries in particular. Um, I have to believe there's some funding source out there that we may be able to look into. So I think it'd be worth exploring. Appreciate that. We always like federal money. So mm -hmm. let's, uh, let's explore the colleges. Um, and without objection, I think we will accept that recommendation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, moving on to the East County campus. This project is for the planning, design, and construction of a fourth, camp, uh, fourth campus in the East County. This project was created as part of the approved FY23 to 28 CIP and included funding of 2.5 million in FY24 for planning. The college is requesting 60 million for this project, 10 million in FY25, and 50 million in FY27. Additional spending would be split half and half by the county and the state. This project does not meet the amendment criteria since this is a biennial year for the capital budget and amendments are limited to project changes. Therefore, the executive recommends not approving this request. The college is requesting a technical amendment to the approved expenditure schedule. 2.5 million is shown to be approved for FY24 as entirely as planning, design, and supervision expenditures, and the college is requesting a change to show $500,000 as planning, design, and supervision expenditures, and $2 million as construction expenditures in FY24. In conclusion, council staff agrees with the executive's recommendation. We recommend moving forward and approving the recommendation along with the technical adjustment to FY24 expenditures as requested by the college. Thank you. Um, and turn to Council Member Mink, but we're this is not to. We are excited about this project, and I was there when we kicked it off. And uh, if the college has anything to say, but I'm going to turn to Council Member Mink first. But this is not to say that we are not excited about this, and we want to move forward. This is just we'll take it up in the full CIP next year, Council Member Mink. 
Exactly. Just to echo the sentiments uh, of, of Chair Jawando, this is a project that East County is extremely excited about, that I know uh, the full Montgomery County and the full council is very excited about, and, uh, and we want to give you our, our full support on that. It is an essential part of our academic ecosystem uh, that is incoming here, uh, as well as the East County ecosystem. So uh, for the millions watching, um, just, you know, this is, this is a technicality. We are looking forward to a big request next year and excellent things to come uh, on, a, on a, as quick a timeline as we can manage. Um, and Dr. Williams, if, if there's anything that you would like to say about the East County campus, as, as mentioned by Chair Jawando, uh, would love to would love to hear you speak to it. Thank you, Council Member Mink. It's, um, thank you all for, for this support, continued support. I will just also just like to share for those um, who are watching, and just as a reminder, as the college, we are simultaneously you know, working and building the East County Education Center. So while we're planning long-term for a campus, we still are in routes and scheduled to open in late fall 23, the Education Center in East County that will meet workforce needs such as healthcare, IT, cybersecurity, uh, business entrepreneurship, and, and um, other endeavors. So I just wanted to say that and appreciate your continued support. Thank you. Thank you, and that's, that's a good point. The work continues. You're going to use buildings that are already erected to start the campus next year, but then we need to start the planning for the actual campus. So um, without objection, we'll accept the county executive's recommendation. OK. And now we'll move on to the Rockville Theater Arts building renovation. This is a new project requested by the college. It provides for the renovation and expansion of the theater arts building at Rockville campus. Funding for this project would be half and half by the county and the state. The college is requesting about $8 million for this project in FY27. Since this is a new project, and again, this is a biannual year for the capital budget, this project does not meet the amendment criteria, and therefore the executive recommends not approving this request. And council staff recommend moving forward with the executive's recommendation. Again, similarly, we're going to have a full CIP next year, which will be just even more fun than this year. <laughs> um, so we will we will take this up again. A great pro project and uh, something that I know the college is excited about. But uh, without objection, I think we'll accept the executive's uh, uh, position here. Okay. Now we'll move on to facility planning, college planning, design, and construction. Uh -huh. The facility planning project provides funding for the campus master plans and facility planning studies for projects possibly being considered for inclusion in the CIP. The planning design and construction project funds for 16 full-time positions in the Division of Facilities and Security Office. The college is requesting a technical amendment to both, part, both projects. This is to recognize a fund transfer of $600,000 from the planning design and construction project to the facility planning project, which was approved by the Board of the Trustees. There is no change to the FY23 to 28 six year total or funding by year for either project. The executive recommends approving this request, and council staff uh, recommends moving forward with the executive's recommendation. All right. Any comments? Without objection. Thank you. Next. Okay, I'll take the last two projects, and the first of these is the Germantown Student Services Center on page five of the staff report. <coughs> uh, for this project, the college did request an increase of 9.1 million across the six years due to the state allowable cost escalation increases of 9%. Um, again, split 50-50 between the, the state and the county like, like other um, split funded projects, and the executive recommended approval of that uh, request by the college. Um, but in this project is where we get into the uh, initial non-recommended reductions of, of the $6 million that the executive provided. As the committee is well aware, while the executive provides total target reduction amounts, the, the council is responsible for actually you know, targeting those dollars to specific projects. Um, so in response to the chair's request, the college did provide non-recommended reduction scenario, which would take the $6 million in reductions in FY27 and 28, so the last two years of the CIP, um, from the Germantown Student Services Center project and would defer those costs from the, the <coughs> CIP period to the, the beyond six years period. So if they're not going away, we just have to come back to it in the next um, full year CIP. One notable change, though, is that since this project is split funded between the county and the state, by moving $6 million of county funding outside of the six-year period, you have to also move the $6 million in corresponding state funding outside of the six-year period as well. So it looks like a $12 million reduction 
um, in actual dollars. Well, it is a $12 million reduction in actual dollars that are moving from the CIP period to the beyond six-year period, but that's just the impact of, the, um, of having to move the state funding along with the county funding. Um, so council staff's recommendation on this project would be to approve the non-recommended reduction um, expenditure schedule, which is shown in the, the last um, row um, of the, the chart at the top of page five, which shows that, that those dollars moving out um, to the beyond six years period, but still includes the increases that were came from the cost escalation increase um, with the understanding that as with all non-recommended reductions, the staff will look for opportunities to restore this funding as part of the, the CIP reconciliation process, if, if possible. Um, we also recommend one small technical change in the project description form um, where it describes the increased costs. We recommend adding language saying this cost is split 50-50 between the county and the state uh, because that's what we typically do for projects that are split funded. So that's just a very minor thing to make things consistent with other projects as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Howard. And, uh, as was mentioned, I appreciate the college responding to our request and, and uh, moving this out. Obviously, still a commitment to the Georgetown, Germantown, excuse me, <laughs> Student Services Center, uh, but realizing the gaps we have, I appreciate you coming back with this. Um, any comments you want to make on this before we? Thank you. Thank okay. you, Chairman Jawanda. This is um, an extremely important project that really it centralizes so many critical services for our students um, who are attending uh, Germantown campus. Um, it's uh, been in the CIP for 16 years. This will, being able to move this forward is essential. We are talking about um, admissions, registration, advising, financial aid, all of these services that are going to help our residents start their post-secondary education you know, in a, in a smart way and an equitable way and also finish strong because those are the same services they'll be using throughout their careers um, at Montgomery College. We have these similar centralized student services um, at our other campuses. They have really transformed the student and the resident experience. Um, it really is critical for us to be able to have the, the funds to, to finally move forward with this and, and bring this to our Germantown campus so thank you Chair and, and and I did want to just ask and if you want to mm -hmm. provide any context obviously there is some money in the in the next few years for this project and how that would be used leading up to the obviously the larger expenditures as we get in the outer years so moving forward with this will allow us to essentially those first steps of the design phase right um, so that's how these funds will be used in order that that initial planning of we know what we want to do <laughs> we know what our students need um, in terms of centralization of, of services but the actual design phase of how things will be organized where will they will be put remember this also comes with a library so it's not just a student services center, it's in a, a library, back to our, the need for modern libraries and the essential uses. So this, these funds would help us enter into that design phase and take that really critical step forward to be able to say, this is what it would look like, this is how it will be fashioned, this is the plan for moving forward and actually constructing a, a physical building. Appreciate it, and I just wanted to point that out. And this is actually, even though we're cutting in the out years, this is a slight increase in the in the in the near term uh, for that planning uh, money and design money, so so that we can put that marker down that this is a commitment. And so, really happy that we're going to be able to do that. Uh, any comments? Okay, Councilman Ray, lead for libraries. Oh, it's true. <laughs> Yeah, th thank you for those comments, and, and I just want to agree with you that the Student Services Center with the library is the heartbeat of the campus. Um, we do not want to see construction delayed, so appreciate you um, putting together the scenario, and uh, we'll work hard to uphold our end of the bargain and make sure that the construction does not get delayed. Thank you. So without objection, we'll accept the uh, recommended reductions in the out years and, and changes to the other uh, totals here. Okay, great. So our last um, project is, is a, should be a pretty simple one. It's the college-wide central plant and distribution systems. And after the executive's um, original CIP was submitted, the college received an additional $823,000 in um, a state grant for this project. And so the, this recommendation would be to increase the FY24 expenditures by that amount. 
um, to recognize the state grant and note that state aid is the source of funds. And the executive also then transmitted this yesterday as part of um, the March um, 15th CIP amendments as well, so it's supported by the executive. Thank you. Without objection, I think we we'll accept that. Um, and I, I do want to just, I alluded to this earlier, but before we move on to the next panel, this, this applies to both MCPS and the college. Obviously, I mentioned we got the executive's budget, uh, operating budget uh, yesterday, and now we, we take it up over the next uh, several months. And um, there are some additional CIP amendments that were, we saw just yesterday that we will not take up today, but that impact the college. Uh, and there was a recommended reduction uh, that I know we've talked about, Dr. Williams. Um, and I, I just want to frame the, the reason for this is there was a write down in the recordation tax, uh, meaning obviously interest rates are at all time highs. There's less activity happening. Uh, and so what we expected to get in that tax, which is a key funder of the CIP, is lower. Um, and so that creates more gap on the gap we already had. And so I just want to make sure we're being honest here that we are going to have to deal with that uh, over the next several months. Um, and, you know, the, uh, while we're not going to take it up today because we, we don't want to do that, we may have to ask everybody to come back, mo most likely, and take another look at this as we move towards reconciliation. But uh, I know these are very important projects. Uh, it's kind of a perfect storm in the sense of the, the cost increases, the escalation, um, interest rates, um, inflation, supply chain, uh, but we know how important these projects are. And so we're going to have to, as a body, uh, deal with what we do. And, and that may include other asks for non-recommended cuts, uh, but it also will absolutely include uh, looking at additional revenues. Um, and uh, we'll talk more about that, but uh, we're going to have to make it all work. So appreciate you being great partners. And uh, so we'll, we'll see you again soon, probably. Uh, with that, I think we are uh, ready to move on to our next item. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you, Chair Jawando. Thank you, Councilmember Albernaz. Thank you, Councilmember Mink. Have a great day. And we're going to welcome up our, our our friends from MCPS. I think we have Seth Adams, uh, our director of the Department of Facilities Management. This is his favorite time of year. Uh, uh, Ms. Adrian Caramias uh, and Mary Beck, I see, from OMB. And Veronica Jawa, is, did I say that right? Hawa. Hawa, I knew that and I said it anyway. Hawa, <laughs> Ms. Hawa, good to see you again. And then obviously Essie McGuire uh, and Keith, good to see you both. Um, so this is our continuation of our conversation around the MCPS capital improvement program amendments. Uh, we had, uh, we will talk about uh, a current situation, uh, the non-recommended cuts, and, and then we'll kind of set the scenario. Obviously a lot has happened since we last met, so we wanna make sure the, the millions watching at home understand and, and we uh, get to ask questions and talk about where we are. So. Uh, I'll turn it over first to our council staff, uh, who's, or, who, or it's Keith. Keith, you're going to kick us off and uh, get us going. Sure. And in addition to what you mentioned, we also do have uh, two supplemental appropriation requests, which we will be um, asking the committee to make recommendations on today so that those can proceed sooner than the rest of the CIP, which is on the May time frame for action. Appreciate uh, you. So Thank we'll, you. We have those built into the same packet today. And there's obviously close connections, which we'll, we'll reference in those. Um, so at your first meeting, um, you had a lot of discussion about the or a summary of, of, of the Board of Education's proposed amendments and the executive's um, or our initial review of the executive's amendments that had come over shortly before that meeting on the 17th of January. Um, and we have some summary information of that in the packet just to provide some continuity. Um, and we'll touch on some of that, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on that today. Um, the other thing we've put in the packet is um, a, 
a chart that provides uh, some demographic information by by school, and in this case, the schools that are uh, impacted by capital projects. This is on page four of the packet. Um, in some cases, we reference some of this information later in the packet in some of the individual project discussion. Um, I will note there are a couple corrections that MCPS identified we need to make in the chart, which we'll do in advance of the full council discussion, uh, but not affecting the projects we were planning to talk about today. Um, in terms of the, the uh, CIP numbers, I uh, just did want to summarize real quick that the, the board's amended CIP was about $1.94 billion. Uh, that was about a 9.3% increase over the original approved CIP. Uh, the executive's recommendation was about $1.87 billion. Uh, that would be about a 5.8% increase, and it was about a $61 million reduction or so from what the board proposed, or lower than what the board proposed. Um, and as part of that, the executive, uh, as is typical in past years, uh, identified, you know, did not identify the reductions to get to that number, but identified what could be afforded in the overall CIP. So that, that uh, the, what we have is an affordability project, like we did with the college, which you spoke about uh, just a little while ago, and also the parks. Uh, and that affordability project was the impetus for the committee in its January meeting to agree to ask the uh, uh, MCPS folks to identify what we call non-recommended reductions uh, to get closer to the executive's recommended numbers, recognizing that the executive CIP at this point uh, is uh, the, only, the only full CIP uh, that we have to balance to right now. And so uh, at least having some options to get to that while the committees discuss all the individual projects uh, is important to provide that flexibility uh, both today, which we'll talk about, but also as part of our reconciliation process. Uh, so uh, a, a similar exercise was done for the college that you just talked about and the parks. In terms of the amendments themselves, we do summarize all of the board's amendments on page six of the packet, and we'll, we'll get into um, uh, each of them uh, a little bit later, so I, I don't want to um, uh, go through them now. Uh, but just as a summary, that, that table does provide uh, the, the, how you get to those totals in the board's amended request. Uh, and the, then the uh, executive made some technical adjustments, um, a number of which the uh, MCPS has concurred with in, their, uh, in some technical adjustments they brought back within their non-recommended reductions. Um, so not a lot of detail on the executive side since we have this affordability reconciliation project we have to deal with. Uh, so we did, uh, the committee asked in a letter to, to MCPS to, to come up with these non-recommended reductions. That was, uh, I believe it went out on the 31st of January. Uh, MCPS came back on the 10th of February uh, with a list of uh, reductions. Those are uh, summarized on page eight of the packet. And I've got two charts there. Um, one chart is what I mentioned earlier, some technical adjustments. Uh, these are expenditure changes in projects. They're not affecting scope, cost, or timing. Uh, they're just updated numbers. And in some cases, uh, uh, they, they, they basically help get to some of the numbers that in the executive request without requiring substantive cuts or deferrals to projects. Um, and uh, so and some of them I mentioned were uh, also recommended by the executive. So we're not gonna really focus on those today so much, mm -hmm. um, but we will be making those adjustments. Um, but on the non-recommended reduction side, uh, we did have some substantive reductions in projects, and I'll just list them real quickly. Uh, we had the Highland View Elementary School addition, uh, as well as the Damascus High School major capital project. Um, both of the completion dates for those schools under these non-recommended reductions would be delayed by two years. The design would be allowed to move forward, uh, so there would be the potential to revisit the project schedule next year. Uh, this is something that we've done with other non-recommended reductions in the past. It doesn't mean we're going to be able to re-accelerate them, though, so we, we don't want to assume that up front, but it does provide the, the potential for that. Um, so those are the two um, projects with the biggest impact on the CIP, and they move about $37 million out of the six-year uh, program. And they also push expenditures out to the later years, uh, which provides a little bit more flexibility as well in terms of reconciliation. 
then there were a few other uh, uh, projects that had uh, reductions in them. Uh, the ADA compliance project in FY24, uh, the roof replacement project in the out years 27 to 28, and then the sustainability initiatives project in FY24. So we'll be talking about each of those in a little more detail uh, in a minute. Okay. Yeah, just yeah. Well, thank you for that overview. I, I mm -hmm. think it would be helpful to take just a, a quick step back. Obviously, these are none of these things are things we would want to do. Um, and uh, and we're not going to make a you know a definitive recommendation today on uh, that we're accepting these cuts because I think we need there are a lot of things in, at play. Um, we but but this is helpful in that the school system has come back to us to say you know if we need to do this this is how we would do it um, and how we would recommend so we certainly want to be attuned to that guidance. Um, uh, you know, I think, uh, and I'll ask Mr. Levchenko to add anything to this, but, mm -hmm. you know, the picture has changed a little bit since we've met the first time. Um, obviously, the, the cost increase have continued to be something that's ongoing. Uh, but we also have now, uh, now that we have the executive's operating budget uh, in the write down of the recordation tax revenue, which I mentioned just briefly, we also have an additional uh, gap that we have to deal with. Uh, the executive also did not, uh, in his, uh, what he sent over yesterday, include the PAYGO allocation, the $80 million of PAYGO that was, the action was taken by the full body uh, when we took up the spending affordability guidelines in, in PAYGO. So if you could just talk about, I just think it's important to frame for everybody, what has changed, what, what our current gaps are, and where we are, so that we just have that information. Right, well, I think you actually highlighted it quite well. The, uh, the, the PAYGO issue is a big one. Um, the, the council, during its spending affordability discussions, uh, identified um, that uh, based on the income tax receipts and the, the um, uh, feeling that those numbers were one time, and should not be used for recurring expenditures. Uh, the, the council supported the concept of uh, uh, a big boost in PAYGO uh, as a good use of one-time resources for the CIP. Uh, however, the executive's recommended operating budget uh, does not assume that additional PAYGO. He did assume some slight increase in PAYGO in his January submission, but that's where he left it. So uh, since it's not assumed in the executive's recommended operating budget, in order to still achieve that, the council would have to find $80 million uh, in some form, either in cuts in the operating budget, uh, use of fund balance, or additional revenues in some way. So that's a, that's a tall order. Uh, so that, that definitely puts us on notice in the CIP that that, that PAYGO assumption is definitely at risk. Um, the recordation tax uh, issue you mentioned, based on more recent information uh, from the Department of Finance, uh, their numbers are down over the six-year period for a recordation tax based on the current uh, law by about 10 or 11 percent, uh, and that's about a $61 million impact on the CIP. There's also an impact on the operating budget, too, but we're focusing today on the CIP. Uh, so that, that also directly hits uh, or, in, or increases the gap uh, that we're dealing with. Uh, so. Uh, as a, in response to that, uh, in the CIP amendments that came over yesterday from the executive, uh, he identified some additional affordability um, uh, reductions for MCPS, the college, and parks. Uh, the MCPS additional reduction was about $31.5 million. So that's not in today's packet, of course. Right. This is all predating that. Uh, but that's an additional reduction that uh, we will need to deal with um, between now and when we reconcile the CIP. Yep. Uh, so that, that definitely puts uh, a different perspective that um, uh, we have a significant gap to deal with. Uh, it doesn't, I mean, it, it looks like PAYGO is very much at risk. Uh, the recordation tax revenue is down a little bit. Uh, so that, that will mean our reconciliation process will uh, need to look at the non-recommended reductions that have come forward uh, and also consider other projects uh, as well. Um, we have an operating budget hearing um, on April 11th and 13th. 
as part of that, what we do every odd uh, every year with a um, uh, odd numbered year CIP is we also include placeholder amendment projects because everything you do this year has to be uh, any substantive changes you make to the CIP have to be through an amendment process and amendments have to go to a public hearing. So we will be providing that flexibility to the council by introducing uh, amendment projects across the CIP in schools, college, parks, county government uh, to provide that additional flexibility. Uh, the goal this year is to try to present scenarios to the council in mid-April uh, that identify how we would reconcile the CIP under different approaches uh, to get us to where we need to go. Uh, we're going to base that on the committee actions to date where they've expressed an interest in moving projects uh, forward, accelerating, or um, avoiding cuts or reductions. Um, and then based on the latest revenue assumptions we have, the latest state aid assumptions we have, and try to bring that to the council for discussion in mid-April. Uh, we don't need to do a final reconciliation at that point, but we need to try to get yeah. closer to, an, to a number that we feel can work in May, uh, and then work towards a final reconciliation in mid-May. Appreciate that, Mr. Lovchenko, uh, for adding that context and so and I just think it's important that we level set that we have some challenges ahead of us and we're gonna have to consider many many different things um, you know I there is a bill that will be introduced on Tuesday Councilmember Mink uh, and I to uh, make adjustments to how we to the recordation tax um, this is something that the previous council when we lowered impact taxes and fees under the Subdivision, formerly subdivision staging policy, now the infrastructure growth and infrastructure policy. Uh, there was a very open discussion in a bill introduced in the previous council that said that because a good portion of those impact taxes go to the CIP uh, that funds schools and other things, that we would need to backfill that. That didn't happen. Um, uh, it was a, you know, for many reasons, and probably because it was election year. <laughs> um, but I, I think that now we are in a situation that's even more dire than when we first met um, and we're in a situation where we're not adding a ton of new projects this is things that we've committed to for years um, and that we said we were going to do that people are counting on it that we're going to do at a time when our students need us to do it um, and so i think uh, while not an enviable position uh, we need to consider everything and uh, as, as uh, the additional cuts you know and one of the things that we'll probably ask mcps to do uh, is to give us some guidance based on the uh, county executives updated uh, reduction to uh, as how you would you know handle that obviously they're not it's not a great decision uh, or in, again cuts that anyone wants to make but also you know, we'll see what colleagues want to do, but I think we'll have a concurrent discussion about how much of that gap can be filled with potential changes to the recordation tax. Obviously, we'll continue to evaluate state aid. Um, and uh, obviously, as I said, the non-recommended cuts. It's important to note too, though, that any change we make a recordation will be, we're trying, we don't know what those numbers are yet because of the write down. So if it's 10, 11% less than what we would have gotten before, it'll still mm -hmm. help. Uh, but we, we're, we're trying to get those numbers from finance and, and appreciate staff working on that. Um, so just want to be very honest and transparent about the challenges we face uh, in trying to meet the needs um, of this CIP, but also future CIPs. It's not, you know, we, we, in the previous action, we took action to defer some conversations from the college to next year's full CIP. It just spoiler alert, it's not going to get easier. Um, and we have we we created a structural deficit in the CIP, uh, and then inflation hit, and all and interest rates and everything, cost supply chain, everything else happened, and uh, we're in a position where, having gone through this a couple times, normally it's about what are the new projects. This is not that conversation. This is about doing what we said we were going to do. That's that's really needed. Um, so uh, I think we're in a, a very different situation that we're going to have to address. Um, any comments from colleagues before we move on? Some comments up to the project. Okay, so we'll move to the projects. Um, so let's go through the projects and sure. And yeah, we'll start with the supplemental appropriation requests and Ms. Yeah, that's, McGuire, that's easy. Let's do that. <laughs> Ms. McGuire will talk about the HVAC uh, uh, replacement project. 
And yes, this is the beginning of going through all the projects, but we did want to start with the supplemental appropriations. And there is a request for a supplemental appropriation in FY23 related to the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, also known as HVAC project, replacement project. Um, this is a perennial um, systemic level of effort project that is always in the CIP. It's a very high priority project. These are major system replacements. They're very expensive and they often can take multiple years to accomplish and they're key uh, infrastructure within the schools. Um, this is an area where certainly um, the board is frequently requesting increases. The council generally tries to meet as much of that increase as possible, um, but it's also one where the backlog exceeds um, the request at all times. The board did request uh, for FY24 an increase of $10 million for this project. Uh, the staff does report that the requested increase is due to cost escalation. It does not uh, increase the scope of the project or of the level of effort. Approximately five projects are anticipated to be supported by the FY24 funding. Again, keep in mind that often those are multiple phases of, of projects over multiple years. The supplemental appropriation request is to advance uh, appropriation for the requested FY24 money. And that is an approach that we've taken most frequently with the relocatable uh, projects, with, which Mr. Levchenko will talk about next. But due to the extensive supply chain challenges that we're having, contract lead times, material procurement times, the school system is requesting uh, that the council advance the appropriation um, for the FY24 expenditures for um, HVAC. Again, so that they that appropriation allows them to begin all those processes, the expenditures would continue to take place in FY24. The executive's recommendation uh, was to support a supplemental appropriation, but only in the amount of $25 million, uh, which is the amount that was already approved. It said that's the amount that's approved for this project in the approved CIP. The $35 million request, again, certainly from the board, incl is inclusive of that full $10 million addition that, um, that the board requested. Uh, the rationale, really, for that lower level um, appropriation amount would be to preserve the flexibility um, of the council at reconciliation in case the full increase that's being requested can't be supported by the final reconciliation. The $25 million appropriation um, in staff's, and staff concurs with the executive on this, that amount would allow the school system to begin its process, begin a lot of the process, and still again provide the flexibility in case the full increase can't be achieved and then the school system could adjust at that point. So the council staff again does concur with the executive's recommendation that uh, we would recommend to the committee a $25 million appropriation for FY23. Again, um, council staff is certainly supportive of that additional $10 million when we get to 24 if reconciliation allows. Thank you, Mr. McGuire. Um, I'm going to turn to Councilmember Albernaz, but just wanted to, if Mr. Adams or any from NCPS, do you want to add any additional information or is that sufficient? No, I would just say that's 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 spot on in terms of where we are. The the unprecedented supply chain is is really driving this supplemental. Um, the uh, previous years, you know, this type of equipment may take six months to receive. Now it takes over a year. So we're we're looking at this as to be able to get started, uh, preserve some of those timelines, not impact the expenditure schedule, but but allow us to enter into contract, release equipment, and be able to uh, maintain our schedules. Obviously, HVAC is so critical. So, uh, Councilmember Robinson. Uh, it is. I uh, just know how challenging HVAC systems can be for uh, larger, older buildings. And uh, at the Recreation Department, a number of the community and senior centers are old schools. <laughs> um, and so we, uh, the, the HVAC systems were a mess. Um, and, but it was, it compounded the problem because as a matter of organic, not formal policy, um, because there was no funding, especially between the years of 08 to like 12, um, there was sort of this broke fix policy that was in place. You waited until something was broken um, before you fixed it, hoping, praying um, that it would hang on one more year. And so there was a significant scaling back of the preventative maintenance contracts, again, in an effort to just get through year over year, um, uh, really, really tough budget years. Just curious as to if you can talk a little bit about sort of the preventative maintenance schedule and the strategy that's being employed. Clearly, we need to support this, but I mean, we could spend 100 million on HVAC and it may still not be enough. So could you talk a little bit more about what steps we are taking 
on the front end, recognizing that that may have an operating impact, but on the long run could actually save us money? Sure, and that is a great question, one that we've actually retooled. Mr. Adams, can you just pull the mic down and a little bit? There you go. Thank you. So, so that is a great question, one that we've we've taken a step back and, and looked at our program and, and focused more on preventative maintenance. So we, we've actually pulled individuals that just are dedicated to preventative maintenance. We've um, created different uh, training programs to fo focus on building the you know the the uh, the knowledge of, of employees to be able to, to work and maintain equipment um, but what I would say though is where we are in our HVAC program is that preventative maintenance program that we've we've started you know, four or five years ago is maintaining what we're installing today but we still have a large backlog that we're we're managing and dealing with um, you know so in terms of I think the balance between the HVAC capital and that of even operating, you know, we, we are hemorrhaging money on temporary fixes, on temporary equipment, uh, emergency services. And so I think, you know, as the, this program has been a uh, program that's, that's been hit uh, during reconciliation for the, the 15 plus years I've been here, it, it does obviously impact the operating budget and it does not ever allow us to catch up and get to a, a place where we, we can maintain uh, this equipment for the full life expectancy that it's expected to last and beyond. Um, but, but yes, good, great point and one that um, you know, we have spent a lot of time on our operating budget trying to figure out what is the best balance with the current funds we have to, to dedicate to preventative maintenance. Um, and that works, but, but when you do have a significant backlog, you, you do need to replace um, you know, much of the equipment that we've outlined in, in this request and then over the next six years as well. I appreciate that, and, and I appreciated Chair Jawando's points about tough decisions that we're going to have to make, um, and what was already a challenge we just heard in the last 24 hours is going to be worse, and that's the canary in the coal mine. Um, the next couple of years are going to, unfortunately, head in that direction. Well, we've been here before. <laughs> we, it's not anything new. Um, we, we have to make uh, tough decisions, and we will, but I would just encourage us to look at um, individual projects and school projects are so important, particularly for those communities for a billion different reasons. But we have to make strategic decisions, uh, and, and sometimes uh, a decision that implement, helps lift up the entire system um, more effectively may be the direction that we need to go. And that could mean uh, the delay of a project that we'd love to be able to get to, um, but we've been hearing from teachers and students about just the ch challenging conditions, um, extreme heat, extreme cold uh, in some of these classrooms, which obviously impacts learning. And so it, it has to be something that um, is an emphasis and focus. And I also do think we need to look at the communities for public facilities. Uh, we have this robust and fantastic opportunity for organizations to be able to take advantage of these fantastic school buildings. We have an enterprise fund there that uh, does not make the schools often whole, uh, particularly when we're utilizing some of these spaces in the summer. So we, we there are other ways uh, that I think we can creatively tackle this, but it, it needs to be a priority. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes. I would like to add that even though it wasn't in writing, the county executive supports funding this cost increase with ESSER funds because HVAC replacement is an eligible cost under ESSER, under the ESSER guidelines. The appropriation or what? Yeah. Okay. And, and the what, funding. Is the proposal, and what is the proposal before us? It's not, it's for general fund. Does the school system have anything to say about the ESSER? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, good morning. Um, Chair Dewan, Joe Ando and uh, council members. Uh, so we do have some remaining ESSER funds. We're about half spent down in our ESSER three funds, and uh, the HVAC is an allowable cost on that. It, of course, would require eliminating other um, uh, things that we currently have budgeted for that. And we are getting to a space now where uh, there's a requi federal requirement that 20% of those funds are used to address learning loss. And so we do need to make sure that we are maintaining those funds um, to, you know, uh, to meet that requirement. But we are looking internally at you know, what we could do um, 
with the remaining ESSER funds as far as shifting some of those around to address some of these needs. And I'll just uh, pick up on the point that Mr. Adams made earlier. Uh, in our budget operating budget request this year, we did include several positions uh, for HVAC maintenance uh, to address uh, some of those concerns that, that you uh, mentioned, Council Member. Mr. McGuire, do you, so how, if, if, if the school system, I always like a good curveball, <laughs> if, the school, if the school system could get back to us, you know, uh, well, let me know what are you thinking how we approach this because if obviously if there are ESSER funds available it would be nice to use them if, if there's even if it's some of the money so uh, thinking out loud um, I think that you know the the question that mr. Hall raises is certainly what would be reallocated and that's something that the committee would want to take up we had anticipated talking about ESSER funds during the operating budget right. um, and I apologize I was not aware that that was the proposal from the executive um, the um, this is technically on the schedule for Tuesday, um, and so we have a couple of options. One is we could um, reschedule that for another week um, and take that time to work through the ESSER allocation with the school system so that, again, I think it would be important for the committee to understand what trade-offs were being proposed in the ESSER funding because yeah. I, my understanding Agreed. is that while it's unexpended, it yeah. is allocated. Um, so that's one option. Um, the other option is that... Um, the committee could certainly move ahead with county funding and preserve the ESSER option for the increase later, but that, again, uh, doesn't take the pressure off the appropriation right now. Those are the two things I can think of right now. Um, yes, Ms. Hawa. Um, that could, this cost increase, I just spoke with Mary, this cost increase can be looked upon later and approve the supplemental as it is for now because the, the, the submission or the recommendation made by the county executive was to approve um, the supplemental with the last approved funding. So if, okay. if it works, it could, that could be moved and be approved, and then after you For go the through the process. the 10 million is what you're saying? It's, it's a 10 million, yeah. which is the second the option that I was yeah. referencing. Okay. The supplemental that that's came cool. over from the executive does reference bonds as the source of funds, and that's what's been advertised. We, again, we can't change that, but I would recommend that if we're going to change it, we would delay the action as well just to be sure that we're all uh, aligned. Yeah, well, let's just delay it anyway because it's not going to, a week isn't going to stop this from going forward. We're going to do it. Let's, can you get us, a kind of a hybrid of option one two like let us know how you how the ESSER's allocation is going if you can use it for that increase the 10 million dollars which is what I'm hearing from you and then we could maybe approve all of it together Seth do you want you have something you want to say no I mean that's certainly that's that's not, I was just I was just going to reference the, yeah. the fact that when we talk about ESSER you know we're, we're talking about 35 million dollars and we're talking about 25 million dollars 25 million was was reduced to what was previously approved i think that's supported by the county executive our conversations with omb over time have been okay 25 is a number that we we previously were able to get to um, 35 however was a reduction and and our conversations have been around can you get to the 35 the delta between 25 and 35 with that's their funds not Got necessarily it. looking at it as okay. a whole but. all right well so you sounds like I'm reading between lines, you'd like us to approve the 25, and then you come back to us on about the 10 with related to ESSER. That would be fantastic. Okay, <laughs> so I'm fine with that if colleagues are fine with that. And then under the, I'm sorry, under that recommendation, we could go ahead and move forward on Tuesday? Yes. Okay. For the 25. Correct. Yeah. Correct, and but reserve, certainly when we come back to reconciliation, we will continue to have conversations and we can also surface it in the operating budget around yeah. the impact of ESSER on this $10 million request. Right, and obviously if we can remove the $10 million request out of our reconciliation process by the by using ESSER, that would be better too and then get, allow you all to move forward. I did want to ask, um, and I'm sure you have something like this, but it would be good to, to Councilman Robinson's point, just kind of an HVAC project list, like where you are in the time of like what is what are you going to use how are you approaching this something that can be transparent to us on the committee but also to the public mm -hmm. about where you are and and do you have something like that because that's something you could create yes absolutely so we we typically provide that to our board of ed through the through our cip process the one the one challenge i would say is that historically that has been very public when we went through covid we went through some cost uh, it, uh challenges supply chain challenges you know, I'll just give you an example. An elementary school that typically was was about 1.5 million to replace its HVAC system has jumped up to four million dollars. 
I mean, it is probably the most drastic cost increase that we've seen yeah. on the construction side is our HVAC program. Four hundred percent. So, so a lot of what we had, we actually, you know, we're, we had to reduce or take some projects off just to show what can fit within those level budgets, which obviously creates some challenges. But we do have that, and we can certainly make that very transparent. I, I would just put the caveat showing um, where we were previously in market conditions and where we are today, just so everyone has the full picture of, of what's happening. Well, I think that makes it even, underscores even it's more important to be transparent about it, because people are like, well, we were on this, we were four years or three years ago, we were supposed to be this place in line, and we need to explain why that's changed. So yeah, if we could work on that, that would be, that would be great. Um, and maybe even if, if there's something we could have in the packet for when we take up the, the ESSER conversation, I think, just as reference. Okay. Is that reasonable? Okay, I see nodding. All right, let's move on. Without objection, we'll approve the twenty-five million, and we'll come back to the ESSER conversation on the ten million. All right, the other supplemental is the relocatable classroom supplemental. This is one that we do expect to come each year because of the timing of the relocatable classrooms being uh, moved and installed and uh, uh, ready and ready for the upcoming school year. That work has to happen in the summer months, and the contracting process needs a few more months before that. So we typically try to approve or advance the appropriation around this time, the March-April time frame, uh, so that they can move forward. Uh, and this year they, they had $5 million in the approved CIP, which they are requesting, uh, but they're also asking uh, in their uh, proposed amendment package for that number to be increased to $7.5 million uh, for uh, two reasons. One. Uh, they are experiencing construction cost increases that are affecting uh, the costs of the relocatable classrooms. Uh, the, uh, uh, and I do have the, the costs noted in the packet, and you can see some of the differences. Um, but then also, um, the relocatable uh, program is also one of the strategies used to address some of the blueprint issues uh, that the committee has talked about in terms of finding um, space at schools for uh, uh, elements of blueprint. Uh, placing relocatables is a relatively quick way you can find that space. Um, so that's also uh, baked into this $7.5 million request. Um, we did receive from the executive a uh, recommendation to approve this request going forward. Um, and I just I do have a couple of tables uh, in the packet on page 11 that um, provide some perspective on the relocatable classrooms program. Uh, the numbers are actually uh, uh, down a bit in terms of placements uh, that are current are currently throughout the system now compared to last year, uh, but over the last ten years the relocatable classroom uh, level has been remarkably consistent. Um, and remember, they're used not just for enrollment bumps, but also when you are doing uh, uh, you need swing space at schools that are having additions done uh, or other work like that. Uh, so you often get a big bump of relocatables that are needed at a site, and then once that project's done, those relo relocatables can move off of that site, but then they're needed somewhere else. Uh, so you see a lot of that. Um, they also are used for um, uh, a f holding schools. Um, there are a few for daycare, uh, as well as um, the enrollment, which is the biggest number. But the enrollment also would include, uh, in some cases, class size reduction needs uh, and full day K, so that can also uh, expand the requirements at a particular school. Uh, so just wanted to provide that background. Now in terms of cost, uh, on page 12 of the packet, um, uh, the numbers uh, for the individual moves are up significantly from past years. We typically saw a $60,000, $65,000 per move number. Uh, the unit costs now uh, that were presented to us were closer to the $100,000 range. So once again, we're seeing the the, the, the market conditions also affect uh, this project. And there's also a lot of other elements in this project uh, that are required, such as site restoration when you, when you move them back off the site, um, all the other elements of, of creating classrooms um, that work in the context of the school itself, uh, fire access, security, uh, maintenance, et cetera. I've, I've listed those all here. Um, and then, of course, this early, uh, although they are moving forward with the contracting process, they won't know exactly where a lot of these relocatables are going until they finalize their enrollment projections for the fall and, and nail that down, I think, closer to the May timeframe. Uh, so 
in, in terms of the exact detail, we can't say where they're all going, except we may know where some of them are leaving, some of the capital projects that are completing. Uh, but with that, I'll just note that staff is concurring with the executive recommendation and, and the board's proposal to move forward with this now. Um, it is uh, current revenue funded, which is a little bit different from, uh, you know, you heard from the HVAC project, which is bond funding or perhaps ESSER funding. Uh, so this project uh, uh, draws down current revenue that is the same funding sources for the operating budget. Uh, so it doesn't have a direct impact, per se, on the affordability gap that we were talking earlier, which was the general obligation bond gap, just as a clarification there. But staff is comfortable with this request. Appreciate it. We're spending cash on something that's needed. Mm -hmm. You know, 545 of these relo relocatable classrooms. And uh, as the packet points out, for example, when you're doing a major renovation at Poolsville, you need these so you can have places for kids to go. So uh, any comments from MCPS on this? No? Any questions from colleagues on this? Okay. So with that objection, we'll, we'll move that forward. And I did want to acknowledge uh, uh, school board member Lynn Harris in, in the back. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us. A frequent ENC flyer. Um, uh, and so, Ms. McGuire, I think we'll turn to you for the go back to the projects in MCPS, the non-recommended cuts, right? Uh, actually, we're just going to continue to go through all of the projects all of that projects. are, okay. what we have in the packet and the remainder of the packet is all of the projects that are recommended for some sort of change, be it uh, an original yeah. amendment or an adjustment from the executive or a non-recommended reduction. Yeah. And we've sort of grouped them by category. So within that, we'll be touching on the non-recommended reductions as they come up in those projects. And if for some reason, uh, I don't know for sure what time it is, but if we don't get through everything today, the committee does have uh, another committee scheduled on the CIP if we need to come back for to continue this or any other follow-up. Sounds good. Yeah, we're 1038, so I think we're, we're in good shape okay. to make it as far as we can. Right. So we are on page 13 of the packet in terms of the project by right, project review, and what we have grouped on this page um, is the set of projects that uh, were previously approved and are recommended for amendments only due to cost escalation. The Board of Education's request does include approximately $91 million of increase to meet the cost escalation in seven projects. These projects are identified here in this table. Um, they are Greencastle Elementary Edition, uh, Lellicott Broadacres Elementary School, Silver Spring International Middle School Project, the New Crown High School, Northwood High School, Poolsville High School, and Charles Woodward High School Replacement. Again, the table does outline the amount of increase that is reflected here. These projects were all approved in the CIP last spring, uh, as the chair was mentioning earlier. Inflationary pressures combined with extended lead times for materials continue to put upward costs on uh, these projects, and um, these requested funds would maintain the project schedules. Two additional notes. Um, <clears throat> of the seven projects, there are two uh, relatively uh, minor scope changes that are embedded within those costs. One is that the increased cost for Poolsville High School does include both the overall cost increase and the addition of a larger size gym and athletic facilities. Uh, and Lilac Elementary School, um, that project continues to be a replacement for the current facility, but the design of that project uh, has shifted from a multi-building solution to a single building solution. Um, and again, design continues on that project, but the cost uh, here does reflect some changes related to that. Is it Lilac or Lilac? MCPS, clear it up for me. I've heard it both ways. Oh, no, the pressure's on. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, is. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's Lelick. I say Lelick. I, I, I think it's Lelick. It, it is. It's Lelick. That's what yeah. I thought. It's yeah. 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 Okay. Yes. You know it's Lelick. I know Dr. Lelick. Yeah, yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. I worked yeah. with her before that's what, she that's passed what I away. Yeah. Perfect. We um, solved it. Thank you. Just a couple other quick notes on the inflation. Um, on the one hand, certainly the rapid pace of inflation that we've experienced recently uh, appears to be slowing somewhat, uh, yeah. but uh, it's not going down. Um, and there is a, a concern that construction costs will continue to rise. Because this is an amendment year, clearly we're not updating all the CIP project costs uh, in the CIP, uh, nor should we attempt to. Um, but when we come back next year, um, we, we may in the full CIP experience um, some cost increase 
increases uh, that may be out of, of what we would ordinarily have expected to see. Um, on that note also, uh, there will be some bid projects coming up over the next year, uh, which will give us real-time experience. There's one for the Silver Spring International Middle School that's coming up fairly shortly, and then most of the 24 projects will begin to go to bid in the next six months. I, we certainly um, can revisit that uh, once we have that actual bid experience, come back to the committee over the course of the year so that we can try to get a handle on how those costs are progressing and what we might expect to see. We also just might note that if there are any unforeseen cost issues over the next year due to inflation, the set aside is really um, the, the primary resource that the council would have to address that if it's necessary. So it may want to be a consideration that we take uh, into account when we are reconciling and determining the ultimate uh, end point for the CIP set aside. Appreciate that, and I'll, I'll, I'll turn to Councilman Mick momentarily. I think it's an important point that these costs of things that we've already approved and have started planning on could continue to go up, and the longer we wait, they could continue to go up as well. And I think, so to the extent that as we're going through this, MCPS uh, has any comment on particular projects in that timeline of, you know, here's where we are. If we move forward now, it, it makes more sense or the cost, you know, I, I think we need to point that out because that's an important factor here. Obviously, things can always go up if we delay projects, but depending on where we are in these projects, that's going to vary, I would, I would assume. So just please chime in if you just proactively on that. Uh, Councilmember Mink. Thank you for teeing me up perfectly with that, actually, uh, Chair Juwanda. So um, I wanted to ask about a couple of these projects that I worry about as we're facing some of these uh, anticipated cost increases and additional pressures. Um, for MCPS, um, in regards to Joanne Lellick, uh, could you all address the demographics and the conditions at that school um, and why it's being prioritized by MCPS in this CIP? So this particular project has been in our CIP for probably eight years, if not more. Um, one of the, the challenges with this particular building is that uh, their, their capacity is above the 740. Uh, 740 is the number where we typically build to the max size for elementary schools. Uh, so the first solutions that we looked at for Joe and Lalek were to put additions at other schools and then do a boundary study. Uh, we spend a lot of time with the community. It's a predominantly walking community. It's a very close-knit community. Um, and certainly doing a boundary that would, would put kids on buses and send them to different schools was, was not something at that time that made sense. So we've taken multiple steps back to, to look at this in terms of how can we build a school that's bigger than 740, but that does not impact the overall programmatic um, operations of the school. So that's where we are, we are today, is that looking at this particular school, they're, they're over capacity. Um, there's a lot of elements in this building that do not meet the programmatic needs of, of the students, uh, particularly you know, the, the needs of this particular demographic in, in this part of the county. Um, so what we're proposing here is to rebuild a school um, that, that meets the needs, that will have everything from community schools aspects, a lot of the blueprint elements that we talk through. Um, but the one big change, though, is that we worked with the community about temporarily relocating during the build. That was never an option before, uh, but, but having those, um, those conversations with the community, it makes sense. Um, they agree that moving off temporarily to, to get the building that makes sense for them um, is in the best interest of that particular community. That's great, and, and I, I, I do want to especially emphasize, I think it's, it's so great that you've worked with the families who want to be able to walk to school. It's so critical for, for this community here. Um, and noting also that the farms rate at Joy and Lilac is over 85%. Um, so this is, this is an incredibly important project. Um, and then one more that I wanted to ask about, another project that hasn't broken ground yet, um, but is gonna have a major impact in alleviating overcrowding at several of the surrounding schools is the Crown High School project. Um, and that's, this project, again, uh, along with Woodward, was delayed by the council last year during this process. Um, could you all speak to the consequences for families in the Gaithersburg area uh, if it were to continue to be delayed? Sure, that, that is another great question. So the, the Crown Project, as it, as it stands right now, is, is intended to solve capacity at multiple high schools. Um, Richard Montgomery, Gaithersburg, Quince Orchard, uh, Northwest, we've talked about um, Churchill. Uh, Wooten is also obviously involved from a, from a proximity and a geographic standpoint. But, but the schools that we're talking about in there from a capacity standpoint are, are trending towards 700, 800 over capacity. 
So when you think about a, a quince orchard um, that is trending on the high end of, of the overutilization, uh, you're talking about you know portables on campus to serve mm -hmm. about 700 students. And the longer you wait, the, the larger it grows. We're faced with the same challenge um, in uh, with with the Woodward project. Uh, you know, you think about a Blair that has over 20 portables on campus, and we're running out of room on a daily basis. Of where do you put these portable classrooms as as projects get delayed and, and as as students continue to come? So Crown is is a critical project because it's not just a uh, a Quince Orchard, every one of those schools are in that neighborhood of 500 to 700 over when the school opens. So that's a that's a tremendous impact on those particular schools the longer this uh, this project takes to uh, complete and open. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Ms. McGuire, I'm going to continue through. All right. The next couple of projects we'll, we'll talk about are some of the individual school projects that were not talked about as part of that general inflationary discussion. Uh, on page 14 of the packet, I have a write-up on the Burtonsville Elementary School. Um, just a little bit of history on it. Uh, the approved project provides for the construction of a 10-classroom addition uh, to be completed in August 2027 uh, at an estimated cost of about $18 million. Uh, I will say the board had requested completion much earlier, August 2025, um, but for fiscal reasons it was uh, pushed back uh, last year as part of the full CIP uh, to the later completion date. Um, I've noted some uh, general facts about the school itself. Um, built in 1952, renovated in 1993, currently has six relocatable classrooms on the site. Um, it is a class size reduction school and does have a relatively high farms rate of about 44.4%. And now what's significant this year is the board is proposing uh, a change in the concept for this project. And this was alluded to in last year's discussions a bit. Um, uh, instead of looking at an addition on the site, and uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the challenges of the site for Burtonsville Elementary School. Um, it's located behind a shopping center. It's a very unusual site for an elementary school and presents a lot of challenges, in addition to the, uh, the building challenges themselves. Um, so what the board is proposing this year uh, is to relocate the school to another site uh, and then the school itself could be reused for some other purpose but would no longer be the Burtonsville Elementary School. Um, uh, the Board of Education recently did hear from staff about a potential um, school-owned site uh, in the area that could uh, be used and they'll be taking that issue up I believe uh, very soon. Um, so actually in the packet I had noted that they supported the site. That's actually a uh, a little bit early to say that they're they heard from staff about it on their way um, but there does seem to be a viable board owned site uh, that uh, you know may be able to step in here and, and be that solution um, in terms of capacity I've provided some uh, information in the packet about that uh, the school is um, in the 124 percent range and looking to go up from there uh, by the end of the six-year period it's a, closer to about 140 percent um, uh, there is some capacity scattered throughout the cluster, but it would be a very uh, difficult boundary change process for some of the reasons Mr. Adams mentioned earlier, for, you know, in other cases. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a significant issue too. Um, so uh, in short, council staff is supportive of the new project scope and timing. Uh, as always, um, we have reconciliation to deal with. Um, this project was uh, delayed last year under a different scope for fiscal reasons. Uh, as Mr. John has, has mentioned well today, we have significant fiscal issues this year as well. So um, unfortunately, this project and others, um, uh, we can't say for certain that we can afford it at this point. But uh, staff is supportive of the concept of the project moving forward. Thank you. Uh, I'll defer first to Councilmember Mink, uh, whose district this is in. Thank you all, and uh, and thank you for speaking to the importance of this project in so many different levels. We know that there's a, an enormous capacity need that is going to be increasing dramatically in the near future. Um, we know that the community has a great need there, that we're at almost half farms uh, for the school, and we know that uh, you know the story of this project is 
long, <laughs> and, um, and there's been a lot of tension and a lot of work to overcome that tension uh, and a lot of promises that have been made to the community that I know um, we all and MCPS certainly uh, f very much feel the importance of upholding those promises. Um, but I understand that there's also an aspect of the project that makes real fiscal sense for the county and for MCPS. Mr. Adams, can you speak to that? Sure, and, and, and yes, yeah, so, so every one of our projects we do look at it in terms of what's the, the maximum dollar value that, that we can solve multiple problems with. So when, you, when we look at a Burtonsville, we've obviously looked at this from a variety of different perspectives. In addition, a uh, project was gonna be very expensive at this school because A, it didn't solve um, you know, the cafeteria issues, it didn't solve the kitchen, it didn't solve the site access, it didn't solve the fact that there are no walkers to this school. Um, but relocating it does allow us to build a new school that allows us to have walkers, that allows us to provide you know, the spaces that, that, are, that are efficient. Um, so just from that standpoint alone, you know, the cost of the addition versus a new school, yes, it's more expensive to build a new school, but, but it's, it, the, the differentiator there is not as great as you would think just from an addition to a new school because of all the core spaces that we have to add. Another aspect too is that um, when we looked at the existing building, if you were able to move uh, the, the Burtonsville to a new location, what would we do with the existing school? We've talked about Blueprint, we've talked about um, you know, our community schools, we've talked about from, from special education, uh, a, a really a growing need. And in this particular part of the county, there's just no public space, right? There's, there's just, this is one of the very few publicly owned buildings in this part of the county. Um, so we, we looked at projects like Green, Greencastle. Um, while we are asking for four million increase in Greencastle, what we're doing is reducing the scope um, significantly uh, you know, to, to offset and reuse the existing building for some of our pre-K and special ed. We can combine you know, some of those services, the pre-K special PEP spaces in the, the old Burtonsville, and it's gonna save us about 10 to $15 million on the Greencastle project. So when you start to combine all of those cost savings, it just makes fiscal sense for this particular project to build a new school and to be able to reuse the existing building for, for uh, regional services that are necessary for that, uh, for that community as well. And I'm hearing also the importance of keeping that project on time for all those other reasons as well. And, and, and I would just yeah. say, I, I know the reconciliation process is, is always tough and it's a bit out of our control, but I, I, can, I think I can speak for you know, the superintendent and the Board of Education. We're gonna do everything that we can to make sure this project stays on its current schedule and if not accelerated. Um, so when we, if we are asked to provide updates in terms of cost savings beyond the non-recommended, I, I can assure you we are not going to look at this school. So any help that, uh, that, can, that can come from the council's uh, direction would be much appreciated for this particular project. It's an important conversation to have. Thank you very much. I appreciate you saying that, which is, you say it in your normal kind of very calm tone, Seth, mm -hmm. but that's, that you don't say that about a lot of projects. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it underscores the commitment the board has and the superintendent um, and I sh that I share, and obviously the district council member shares, uh, and I think many of us share that this has to move forward. Uh, it cannot be delayed again. Um, and we, we're, we are dealing with challenges. We had a couple of schools in the full CIP a couple of years ago, like South Lake and others that we put in a similar category, and I think that's where this is. So uh, appreciate you saying that um, to turn to staff to, to move on. So we, ex you know, obviously, I think we've said we agree. <laughs> with the council staff's recommendation. Uh, next up, the Highland View Elementary School addition. Uh, this is an approved project to provide an eight classroom addition to open in August 2027 to relieve overutilization at the school uh, at a cost of about 16.8 million. Uh, the project itself was not, rec not proposed for any change by the board, uh, but it's come back as part of the non-recommended reductions. I mentioned earlier, along with Damascus High School major capital project, uh, that n the non-recommended reduction would defer completion of the project by two years, from August 2025 to August 2027. Um, I've got some basic information on the school. It opened in 1953, was renovated in 1994. Uh, it has six relocatable classrooms on site. Uh, it is a class size reduction school and is located in an equity emphasis area. Um, we do have a report that identifies all the schools that are in those areas. Uh, and it does have a higher than average farms rate as well at 39.9%. Uh, 
a little bit lower than what you heard from Burtonsville um, uh, and uh, uh, some of the other schools earlier. Um, I do also have some of the capacity discussion here. Uh, the capacity problem, not quite as, um, as high as at Burtonsville, uh, but still getting into the mid-120s by the end of the six-year period. Um, there are some schools uh, uh, in the area that, that have some excess capacity, um, although once again, you're starting to, you, you would have to start to chop up uh, the, the community. There's no one solution to that, so that does create uh, significant challenges. Um, once again, it came to us as a non-recommended reduction, uh, so it's not, uh, it was not something that was uh, proposed for change. Um, uh, so for purposes of moving forward with reconciliation, it is in the mix. Um, uh, we have to look at that, and um, uh, as Mr. Adams mentioned, um, uh, they provided uh, that and the Damascus project to us, um, depending on where the numbers fall. Um, we would want to try to respect the, the school's um, uh, priorities where we can. Um, uh, if we can find additional resources uh, to allocate to the CIP, then we would look at trying to, to um, uh, fund some of these issues. But uh, right now, it is, I think it is flagged as a non-recommended reduction, and we'll have to uh, yeah. see where we go over the next month or two. I, I appreciate that. and. Uh if colleagues want to say anything, they can. But I, this is obviously, since this is the first one we're taking up of the list that was sent back, and I appreciate the superintendent and the board uh, and staff sending back the non-recommended list. Again, it's called a non-recommended list because you're not recommending that it be cut. Um, but that if you had to meet, this is uh, the reductions, this is how you would do it. Uh, you know, I think we're, this is another school where it's 70 years old and it had a renovation 30 years ago. Um, and, and there's obviously need. Uh, they are at 40% farms rate, um, and so we're in the we, we are quickly in the tough decisions category of you know things that we would like to move forward. Um, I, my intention as chair and w today is to not say that we are in, you know for this cut, but that it's got to be in the mix. Uh, it was recommended to to Mr. Lovchenko's point of. This is the school. If we have to make cuts, if and when we have to make cuts or delays, that this is what the school system said, and we need to. Re I think your prioritization is informed by a lot of factors. So, uh, you know, again, I've talked about how I will hope that we will be able to keep our commitments, and we can figure it out through other changes, including new revenues and state aid and the like. Um, it's in it's informative that uh, this is on your list. So. Councilmember May. Uh, thank you, and um, just wanted to give you an opportunity also to, to speak to these projects, um, Damascus and Highland View in particular, um, about the, you know, if you could tell us a little more about the condition of Damascus. Uh, the, you wanna wait on that? Okay, okay. We, yeah, we do have that coming okay, up in okay. a little bit. So yeah, Highland View though is the perfect time to View. speak to that. Yeah. yeah, if you want to speak to the consequences there um, in terms of the enrollment that we're facing, capacity, and so on. So so yes, this this one you know from a, a non-recommended perspective, we mm -hmm. look at it as as purely from a from a capacity standpoint. Um, so it is obviously it's over capacity, but when comparing it to some of the other schools that are over capacity, it's it's, it's lower. Um, Percentage-wise, than some of the others. The one thing I would say about this project, though, is that it has been delayed year after year um, for multiple years. Um, one of the things that we are doing, though, however, is is um, looking at this project in terms of uh, wh what else is needed here. That's possibly a smaller scope um, that that could provide some big benefits to the school while we wait for an addition. And one of those is ADA accessibility. You know, with the uh, for those that that know the site, the the upper play field is inaccessible, you know, so we we developed some options for how to do a, a smaller scale accessibility project if for some reason this project gets delayed so that we can provide some some level of support to this particular school. So I just wanted to put that out there because we always do look at, at ways to, you know, if, if not receiving the full cost, are there things that we can still do that, that are big impact. Thank you. You good? Okay. So let's move on. Okay. Yeah, next up we have um, countywide projects. I'll turn to Ms. McGuire on that. 
Uh, many of these projects that we'll go through now uh, are either systemic projects that address um, all uh, schools in the county, and then we will end with a discussion of the major capital projects uh, that you mentioned, Councilmember Mink. The um, first project up is the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, ADA Compliance Project. Um, this project uh, was recommended for continuation in the board's budget, um, however, it did come back for a uh, non-recommended reduction uh, in two million from the approved expenditure level in FY24. Um, this is an important project uh, that almost goes without saying. Uh, the school system did do a very comprehensive assessment of ADA accessibility across school facilities. The results of that assessment are available online. And this CIP project addresses standalone projects that aren't uh, anticipated to be covered through other construction projects. Uh, so many ADA concerns are taken care of in major construction, this one speaks to issues um, similar to what Mr. Adams was just describing, where, uh, where there are smaller scale ADA projects that can be accomplished to improve accessibility for students and for staff and, and for uh, the community at all, as a whole. Given the importance of addressing um, the identified barriers, uh, this may be an important restoration if possible. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, and uh, colleagues want to chime in, they can, but yeah, I, I think this one is, to your last point, uh, you know, we don't need to be taking steps backwards on ADA. Uh, we've heard that loud and clear from our residents. Um, I, this is one I'd like to not accept uh, and to restore and put on the list, and and hopefully we can keep it keep it through the process because these are uh, in the co in the context of the larger CIP. This is not a huge amount of money, but it's something that uh, is really important. And I want to allow if Mr. Adams or any from the staff wants to talk about the just give a couple of examples of what these projects look like I think that would be helpful well, well so thank you for that and we actually did do a uh, an ADA update for our, our Board of Education here just about two weeks ago that really highlighted the, the the amount of work we've been able to accomplish over the past several years but but to, to answer your question about what types of projects you know many of the projects that we see are are anything from a from a small scale um, site-related improvement, you know, that uh, you know may allow better access from parking lot to building, um, better access to building to playgrounds. Obviously, a lot of our restroom work uh, happens in, inside the building to make sure that our restrooms are compliant. Um, so that's some of the small scale. As as we've been asking for more money, we are looking for some of the bigger uh, scale items. I, I can think back um, a couple years ago, one of our projects at Damascus Elementary was to put in an elevator. Um, exterior to the building because it didn't have accessibility up to the second floor. Those are the projects that, that we want to keep on track. Um, you know, we, we solve it through accommodations if, if, if funding gets cut, uh, but obviously we don't want to do accommodations to that extent. So uh, this is a critical program for us as well, um, and obviously it's, this is truly a non-recommended uh, reduction here because I think we have really good momentum uh, that, that we've been building around our ADA improvements. And uh, you know, I, I think, you know, again, if, if not funded, we just do another year of accommodations in smaller scales, um, which would be the, uh, the way to approach it. Appreciate it. And, and if, if, if we don't have it, if you could get that report that went to the board, maybe cl include that when we bring this up uh, for the yeah, whole council. Absolutely. Your colleagues yeah, agree. There is a link to it in the packet, yeah. too. Okay, it's, it's It was the same um, presentation that included some of the discussion of the um, non-recommended reductions as well as the uh, Burtonsville site issue oh, perfect. that's referenced okay. earlier. I did see that, um, thank you. So we'll, we'll, we can forward you the link to that. Okay. Well, without objection, then we will restore that from the committee level. Thank you. Continue. So the next project is the Building Modifications and Program Improvements Project, often called BIMPI. Um, this project supports a range of modifications that are needed for program implementation in schools. This can include, include anything from science labs, special education spaces, or other sort of specialized projects that, again, in schools that don't have other major construction anticipated. The approved FY23 and 24 funding level was a small increase over the previous years. Um, for FY24, the board has requested a significant increase of $10 million uh, for a total FY24 funding level of $18 million. Um, the, the areas that are identified by MCPS and the board for this level of increase are outlined a little bit in your packet on page 17. They include um, an effort to increase uh, the ongoing work to retrofit restrooms uh, for gender neutral spaces. They also include, uh, again, blueprint implementation, similar to what we were describing in the relocatables, as we add pre-K, as we add community school spaces, 
services, many of the um, other expansion of services in uh, the blueprint. We do just need to find ways to accommodate the spaces within the schools. And then also changes to special education. So those are the reasons cited for the significant increase. Um, the non-recommended reduction scenario identifies a technical adjustment. So I do want to clarify that while it's a big number, uh, it is a technical adjustment and does not reflect uh, a change to the scope or to the projects. It's, it's a change in spending patterns. Uh, council staff uh, is supportive of, of this project. Uh, without objection. The next project is the MCPS Materials Management Building Relocation, also known as the Warehouse. Uh, this uh, project is intended to initiate the process of relocating the MCPS Materials Warehouse from its current location at 580 Stone Street in Rockville. Um, this is a very challenged facility. It has been for quite some time. It's, it's, um, very, it's significantly old. Uh, it's also undersized for the current needs of the system. And there have been a number of efforts over the years to try to relocate it for reasons related to funding or other logistics logistical complications that hasn't come through. Um, and I would just note, too, that the community surrounding the warehouse has been um, particularly um, interested in advocating for improvements uh, to that property or for the relocation of the, of the warehouse due to the impact of the property on the neighborhood. And certainly the city of Rockville has advocated very strongly as well. Again, it's a shared interest. Uh, the good news is that it seems like the logistics are finally coming together and they may be aligning. Um, there is a um, a proposed um, solution between uh, the executive branch and the school system to lease space. Um, as a result, the funding in the CIP um, that is recommended would be to accomplish the fit out and construction that's needed to um, uh, align the, the new space with the warehouse's needs. And the plan would be to begin that transition um, as early as this fall, certainly not to interrupt the continuity of operations for opening schools, but shortly thereafter. Um, you know, given uh, th th this may be a really important opportunity to maintain, um, and the funding is going to be important to maintaining the time timeliness of that opportunity. I appreciate that, and I'm thankful to DGS and MCPS for working on the, the solution. And we, we heard, we met with this, the city of Rockville, and this was one of their top items with, between the mayor and the council members. So I think this is, uh, this, I'm really was happy to hear this when, uh, when I got the update. Uh, Councilmember Albernaz. This is a twofer. So not only will we get a more appropriate warehouse um, that better fits the needs of the school system, because it's a challenge to say the least, um, and has been there for generations and has not grown alongside the increased capacity needs of the school system. But we talk about the need for additional revenue. That is a prime site for potential economic development growth in the county. And I think in the long run could um, help produce additional revenues that will help us in a variety of areas moving forward. And there are some really exciting plans in the works for that particular site. And I do want to give a lot of credit to the city of Rockville, who has been aggressively seeking public-private partnerships and did a lot of really strong legwork to work with both DGS and MCPS to look at um, multiple solutions here. So this, this project is very exciting um, and, and will be one that we'll all be following. Good. So yeah, with, without objection, we, we agree with the importance and the, share the excitement that this could move over move with the least option and that could free up that space to for other potential things in the future so let's move oh yes all right as long as it's good news yes it is okay. actually i just want to add that the county executive is providing and the funding for the lease of this new warehouse through the operating budget and what's the for the know, mcps it's the, a million dollars a million dollars mm -hmm. okay but this is so this the 2.5 here is for the fit out for the fit out got it for the infrastructure piece and then the lease side so it's 3.5 million that's a good deal for the how this building is if you have if you know we should put a picture up right now to show people how bad it is so all right thank you so let's let's move on the next project to highlight is roof replacement um, in uh, this is again another high priority systemic 
project. Last year, the council was able to fully fund the board's requested increase for 23 and 24. Um, the board did not request a change to this project. The school system uh, did provide a possible reduction to, uh, I'm sorry, a possible non-recommended reduction to this project to meet the scenario. I would note that that reduction is in the out years. It's in 27 and 28, which would give us certainly the opportunity to revisit that next year in the full CIP. Appreciate that. I know this is a common tool along with, you know, we talked about HVAC, but roof replacement. And I appreciate that you put it on there in the out years so that anything that's urgent can be addressed going forward. So I think following your lead, we'll leave it on there as a potential reduction uh, and in, in the mix as we figure out the entire CIP without objection. The next project is school security. Uh, the board did request an increase of $2.5 million in this project for FY24 to update electronic access and continue to install updated security technology at schools. Um, this project has been used to address a wide variety of security needs in the schools, most recently to address entrance vestibules and guidance and guided entryway uh, access. Uh, if the committee would like more details on the specific FY24 efforts, um, certainly we can get an update from the system. And this was, they had no change from the county executive? The board, well, it, it was not specifically identified by the executive, but again. Um, was this one of the non-recommended? No, no, the board requested no an increase. It's from not three, one 13, of. From 13.5 to 16 million, right? Correct. Okay. And so that's the two and a half million in FY24. So the board's requested increase would be what's on the table. I mean, certainly okay. the whole thing. Could but you provide a little more context then, this Mr. Adams or whoever, about what, how that's going to be used and the needs for that, since it's in the next year? Sure. So, so we've spent a lot of time talking about school security and enhancements, and and one of the elements that that we've talked about is the infrastructure behind it. So, obviously, you know, one element is cameras. Cameras are a big part of our our security infrastructure. We're also, we've been piloting different um, electronic access, even in classrooms and other exit, exit doors. Um, we're, we're looking to start rolling that out in a more robust way. Um, so this, this increase is really for us just to, to stay with the times of security infrastructure. And, uh, you know, I, I would just point out, though, the, um, this is for FY24, but I would, I would imagine that next year we will come back with um, a higher level of effort for the out years as well around this because this is something that's um, emerged as something that we've been falling behind with in terms of infrastructure. So I would add this to the list of requests for like a plan because obviously, you know, like I'm sure you have one of, especially since you previewed the next year's increase, like kind of what, you, what you've done and where you're going and, and obviously the vestibules have been something we've all seen. The, the locking doors, we're in a different environment. I know parents and caregivers and students themselves have been asking for this. So if, um, if you could just, as we come back to this next year, or later this year rather, um, include uh, an update on the plan and just flag that for staff. But this seems fine with me without objection. Okay, thank you. The next project, <clears throat> pardon me, is stormwater discharge and water quality management. Um, this is a level of effort a uh, project that has had uh, a fairly steady level of funding to address certain needs. The Board of Education has requested a significant increase in the level of effort for this project across the six years. Um, the st uh, and again, we may want to get more detail from, uh, from MCPS, but the um, issue identified here and the reason for a, a higher level of effort ongoing is that given the um, lower uh, the increased water quality standards. Uh, MCPS is experiencing a higher frequency of need to replace, repair, remediate um, fixtures uh, and maintain that compliance. Um, and so that does, is resulting in a higher level of effort anticipated as just, again, the work to maintain the compliance increases. Okay. Makes sense to me. Do you, anything to add, Mr. Adams? No, I would just say our, our systems are safe, though. I mean, when, when I think people see lead in the water, they, they definitely panic. But we, we do have a robust program where we test annually, provide those reports. Um, the, the only aspect to this is that um, due to the state and, and local levels significantly reducing lead levels. Yeah, we took be, action be, on this uh, yep, a few years yep, ago as well. Be, Hunter, below uh, below um, actual EPA levels. You know, we even see some new equipment, new fixtures that fail. And so this is really to, to be able to maintain, you know, that, that level of high quality 
um, and, and be able to keep up with the constant testing as we move forward. As soon as you test, even if it is brand new and it, it tests at, at, at above that five uh, parts per billion, it comes out of service and we have to put in an action plan. So this is to address that, uh, that approach. Appreciate that and I'm really glad we worked on that and took, took that uh, preventative measures and obviously it's important. So without objection, let's move on. The next project is sustainability initiatives. This project was first approved last year in the full CIP and dedicates funding to support projects that advance the system's project to progress towards climate action goals. Um, and again, uh, new schools, uh, new construction certainly do meet those higher standards. This uh, is these funds are identified to address retrofits in areas that may have a significant benefit. Um, this project was put forward for a non-recommended reduction scenario. It, the non-recommended reduction would identify a possible reduction of 2.5 million in FY24. Um, staff would note that even with that reduction, we would be looking at level funding from last year's approved level, and it would still um, maintain uh, $5 million in FY24, even with that reduction. So it does seem that it, again, would leave the room to continue efforts. Appreciate that. Again, another non-recommended, uh, but glad that you can continue some sustainability initiatives if we would have to take this for the larger CIP. You know, we're going to do our part here in the Education and Culture Committee to be good partners with the rest of our colleagues when we get to reconciliation. So um, uh, without objection, we'll move, move forward. <clears throat> Beginning on page 20 of your packet, uh, we're going to move into discussion of what are called major capital projects. These are projects that affect major construction at schools uh, that may need sort of a range of uh, upgrades, facility upgrades, but major modifications more than can be done through the pieces of systemic projects. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, the projects are divided up into major capital projects elementary and secondary. The um, elementary projects are listed here on the top of page 20 of your packet. That project is not identified for any changes, but I did just want to highlight those projects in case uh, council members are interested in any updates on them. I would just note <clears throat> the school system does report that all the projects, of course, are experiencing challenges of supply chain delays. Burnt Mills, South Lake, and Stonegate remain on schedule to open in August of this year. Uh, the board's request does reflect a six-month construction delay for Woodland, which would then now be proposed to open in January, uh, uh, six months later. Um, Piney Branch Elementary School is uh, not under construction. It's currently in planning. Those funds are included in this project, uh, and that would we would anticipate that to come back for uh, a, re a request for construction and for um, a completion date once the planning is complete. So I'll pause in case there are any questions on the elementary projects. No, no I think we mm -hmm. can move on to the okay. secondary. Great. <laughs> I apologize. The major capital project secondary includes a number of projects. There are two middle schools, Nielsville and Eastern, and then there's Poolsville, Damascus, Magruder, and Wooten High School. There are no amendments or reductions identified for Nielsville and Eastern or for Magruder and Wooten. Uh, there are tables for those four projects to reflect their funding schedules as, uh, as noted below. Um, I did list the um, completion dates for all of those projects, uh, again on page 20. Nailsville has an anticipated completion date of August 2024. Eastern Middle School, again, is in the planning process, similar to Piney Branch Elementary. We would anticipate that to come back once that planning process is complete. Poolsville High School has a completion date of next August 2024. Damascus's current completion date is August of 2026. And then Magruder and Wooten both have completion dates of 2029. Um, as we noted earlier in the discussion regarding inflation, uh, the board did request an increase of $8 million for Poolsville to address both overall cost and support the um, adjustment in the size and scope. The committee uh, indicated support for that earlier. That does bring us to Damascus High School. The board's request does not include any amendments for Damascus High School. However, the non-recommended reduction scenario puts forward a two-year delay for Damascus to reduce funding in the six-year period overall. While this is obviously a significant delay, it would still complete the Damascus project one year earlier than either Magruder or Wooten projects as they are currently scheduled. Councilmember Ludke uh, did write a memorandum to the committee uh, requesting support for maintaining Damascus on schedule that is in your packet. 
Council staff would just note that one challenge that we have with the CIP, and certainly as we talk about reconciliation, is that right now we do have in the CIP and have for a couple of years a large number of very major projects. High school projects are large, they are expensive, um, and certainly they also are timely in that for a number of years we were working heavily on elementary schools, we're now seeing those kids move through uh, the system and we're seeing them in, in high schools. Also these are high schools that clearly have infrastructure needs. That said, it's very challenging to stack a large number of high schools smack into the middle of the CIP and that is where we are. And given the cost pressures, um, I think that really is, again, it's not recommended. Everyone would like to move this project forward, but given the cost pressures, one advantage to addressing one large project is it prevents an impact on a lot of smaller projects that may have to domino their way through the six years in order to achieve the same level of savings. So again, on purely practical levels, um, I don't want to speak for the system, but certainly that would be um, a way that the uh, recommendation would make sense from a fiscal perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGuire. And as I said, and I'll continue to say, we, you know, we, since we requested these, there's, we might have to request some others. Um, obviously, uh, we don't want to, we would love not to delay anything. And I appreciate you acknowledging uh, Councilmember Lukey's letter. I spoke, I've spoken to her this week about this. And um, so while we're not uh, approving or anything right now, I think this is instructive from the school system to know how you would handle a potential reduction. Uh, Councilmember Ming. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to give NCPS a moment to, to speak to this one in particular as well. Um, Damascus was built in 1950. It's our oldest school, as I understand it, that has not had a major renovation. Um, and, uh, and so we are at a point now where a school that is uh, that holds that dubious honor is now on our non-recommended cuts list. Um, so, Mr. Adams, could you provide a little more detail on the condition of the building, um, the challenges that students are, and families are facing, and so on? And, yeah, so certainly Damascus High School, you know, does present challenges, you know, of, of existing space, you know, as, as that relates to program opportunities and access. So, you know, this is critical from an infrastructure standpoint. Um, it's actually one of the, the few schools that have been, had, had multiple additions. I think, I think when we counted 11 additions over the years as this, as this building, first opened and then obviously grew over time. Um, so even just with that, uh, that creates challenges of, of how that patchwork has, has been put together. Um, so infrastructure is critical for us. Um, this building is um, critical for regional career technology for us as well. I mean, we're looking at it in terms of, if you remember when we talked about Seneca Valley and this, this regional uh, approach to our, our career technology, Damascus was a critical uh, school in terms of being able to serve those needs. So being able to provide spaces that make sense for that program is, is a big part of this work. And then the other aspect of this is that um, to the Seneca Valley boundary, you know, if you recall, we, we did not fully relieve Clarksburg uh, High School. So a, a big part of this project is expanding Damascus in order to relieve, you know, those 600 students that are growing at Clarksburg. So there's a combination of elements with this particular project, everything from infrastructure, program, to adjacent cluster capacity uh, that, is, that is critically important. And, and while obviously it's still a non-recommended delay, it is one that, um, you know, we, we would offer up, as, as Ms. McGuire said, is because it is a large project, it is a large amount of money, um, with some of the county executives' um, budget elements, you know, you, you either impact all projects or one project. And, and that's the sort of the balance as we go through this. So delaying Damascus was able to solve those funding challenges by looking at it just at one individual project versus every project in our CIP. Thank you, I appreciate that. I think it certainly speaks to just how serious our construction and renovation problems are and how badly we need more revenue and uh, you know to, to look for some real solutions here to support MCPS CIP. And uh, everyone on the Education and Culture Committee knows that kids get older. <laughs> yeah, so so we, we know that they, that they need to be in high schools. Um, okay, so we'll uh, move on from that one and just realize it's on the table, but uh, hopefully figure everything out. 
So unless there are other questions about the secondary projects, that does complete our review of the project by project, um, our project by project review. Uh, what council staff did include in the, um, as, as the last section of your packet, um, certainly during public testimony and if, through other occasions as well, council members frequently hear from uh, school communities who are concerned about the time span over which their lunch periods take place. This is generally um, felt most acutely at the elementary school level because of the number of lunch periods they need to accomplish and, and also generally um, acutely felt in schools that are overcrowded. Um, so the, the um, Council Member uh, Jawando as well as Council Member Stewart had requested information on all the lunch periods uh, uh, and time across the district. Um, MCPS has provided that information. Uh, we went through and compiled it in the back of your packet. We grouped it by time and by level and tried to highlight projects that are uh, up for major construction in the CIP. Um, the, uh, I will say that the packet uh, reflects a number of schools that we did not have the information at the time this was put together. The school system has since provided that and I will distribute it uh, separately so that everybody has it. Um, just again to note that, you know, certainly again when, when we talk about an overcrowded elementary school and frankly at any level, it, it often that overcrowding is most acutely felt in the common areas and the cafeteria is going to be one of those. The good news that is that a number of the schools with earlier times do have projects, certainly not all. Um, and I do know that the school system does work closely with schools to see are there any operational challenges that, I'm, I'm sorry, operational changes or amendments, uh, adjustments that can be made within the school to uh, help ameliorate that and help uh, reduce the, the, the shrink the lunch period um, through other means other than construction. So those conversations are ongoing and at any rate the information is here. I would just make one more comment on it which is that um, high schools by and large have gone to one lunch period. Uh, that's a very big benefit uh, yeah. to high schools in scheduling. It does mean that the kids are eating everywhere. Uh, there's not going to be uh, a, a it's not necessarily an efficient use of space to build a cafeteria that can hold 2,000 people at once. Um, and so, uh, again, operationally, the schools uh, have worked and with the central system to make what adjustments are needed to help uh, support high schools in that effort. Appreciate that. Yeah, I've, I've been in our high schools at lunchtime. It's uh, it's like a everyone's all the people are sitting on the floor. It's like it's it's, a, it's an interesting thing. I, I just wanted to provide. I appreciate this and the highlighting of the packet of. It's just for folks watching at home, the, the millions. Thank you, Mr. Councilor Mink, for using that. It might have been your first time. Um, uh, the highlighted ones on Circle 29 are the ones that have the, are projects that are in the CIP soon. So when you see something like Eastern, where, where you have people eating as early as 10 17, they do have a project in the morning. They do have, have a project uh, that's in the CIP. There are some that are eating early that aren't. Um, but uh, this is helpful for us to kind of know and I think to just reflect upon and I would ask that you know this is something that we'll probably come back to uh, after budget and just check but I think it's helpful for the public to know where things are and if, if MCPS wanted to comment at all on any you know thoughts or potential uh, ways you're addressing this or planning around around this because it is a, an area of community concern that we hear about uh, quite often. Well, I, I would say, you know, so the, uh, the cafeteria start times are a function of, of space, you know, numbers of students, and then logistical operations. One thing that we are doing is, um, you know, we have some really creative um, and smart principals at our schools that, that have figured out ways to, to navigate these challenges of tight spaces, large number of kids, and reasonable, um, you know, cafeteria uh, functions. And so we're using those lessons learned to, to go to some of the schools that you see that have extended periods to see how, how can we tighten this up? How can you think differently about eating and recess and how which grade levels come through, um, particularly at the elementary school level, um, efficiently so that you can tighten up your operations? Um, many of these you'll, you'll see they, they, they do try to, to keep at grade level, you know, and, yeah. and it is manageable that way. But when you start to spread out the duration of, of lunch operations, it, it does make sense then for us to, to bring back um, lessons learned from their peers that, that could improve situations. So that is what uh, Ms. Guire referenced in terms of us constantly working with you know, individual schools. Appreciate that. Um, all right, well, if there's no comments, we will, uh, Councilmember Mink has a comment. Yes. 
Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate all of you coming today uh, and, and all the wonderful work putting the packet together um, and for all your insights on the projects. I just uh, had a quick comment and question for, for central staff. Um, so as we're, as we're looking at, and this overview was provided um, by Chair Jawando, um, we're, we're, we're looking at increasing pressures from all angles on the MCPS CIP at this point. Um, we've got the executive with the budget that doesn't have the PAYGO funding that we were, um, you know, that, that we had hoped to find here. Um, we've got MCPS projects up for, up for consideration again next year um, that have not gone out for bid, and we're going to be seeing large cost increases due to inflation there. Um, we've got the 2020 impact tax that reduced funds, um, and we're never backfilled by our recordation tax increase at that time. Um, now our recordation tax revenue estimates for the next few years have just decreased significantly as well. Um, and many of our colleagues are not going to want to delay some of the major uh, transportation projects that the executive has recommended for delay. Um, so given all of that, if I could just have you reflect on uh, how the MCPS CIP is looking right now in FY24 and beyond, um, and what the impact of a recordation tax increase would have on the prospects for avoiding delays um, to these multiple large projects in the MCPS CIP over the coming years. Well, what you just summarized is exactly what we're working on right now based on what the executive had sent over yesterday. So. Unfortunately, I can't give you an answer today, other than generally what we've said is that the situation is a lot more difficult. Uh, the PAYGO issue alone um, is a significant issue. The recordation tax I mentioned, that was a $61 million hit on the, on the CIP, just, ba on, on, just on the baseline. Um, uh, transportation projects are, are coming up for discussion next week. Uh, so uh, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, as staff, we are planning to try to update these macro numbers as soon as we can based on all this information that we, we got yesterday uh, and hope to have you know something to be able to convey to council members uh, within the next few days. Uh, unfortunately, I can't say today where those numbers are, except that they're worse than they were a couple days ago. I, I only would add to that that, um, and again, it, the non-recommended reductions that the committee requested earlier and that MCPS responded to was um, were, were to meet a different target. And again, that target has worsened in all the ways that it has been described. And so we really, and again, this, this all broke yesterday afternoon late, so we're all catching up to it. But, um, but what we don't have is the information that would um, really give us the specifics of where to go with that. Certainly we can talk about it on a staff level, like there are you know, ways to go about that, but that's again where we feel like we don't necessarily have those answers for you. The information that we all just went through uh, as helpful as it was, relates to an earlier and a different target. Um, and again, that target is significantly different now. Thank you. Appreciate that. Council Mayor Albano. Thanks. I appreciate the point, but, um, and we'll have a robust conversation when the bill is dropped. But recordation taxes are difficult to guess because it's not like the property tax, which you can count on. Um, th there, there is a, a threshold by which depending on the size of the recordation tax, it actually could lower the amount of commercial transactions that happen if, if it's high enough that it prevents people from um, seeking those transactions. So it's a difficult thing to forecast. Um, and while clearly we need more revenue, um, and, and we will have a conversation about that, and the 10% the increase in property taxes, um, it has to all be looked at, not just through the needs, which there are many, and there will be as long as we and future councils are going to be on this dais, um, but also the overarching impact as well. Context here is going to be really important, um, and, and our public needs to understand that. There are a lot of, this is a complicated issue. It's not as simple as raising revenue and addressing capital needs. Um, there is a sweet spot and a threshold that has to be considered as well. So we will have those conversations. I look forward to them, um, but and it's tough uh, with with the current situation that we find ourselves in now. But we'll get through this. We have before, um, and I'm confident of that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Alvarez. Thank you, Councilmember Mink. I appreciate the comments. Yeah, I was when we were going earlier. Mr. Lipchenko, I was writing down. Okay, 61 million, 30 million here. Look, I was just like, all right, I'm gonna let you do the math and get back to us based on 
so we know what the what the level of the challenge is, right? That's kind of step one of figuring out what the gaps are. Uh, obviously, we took some steps today to review the non-recommended cuts in the other projects. Uh, uh, we only added, only didn't recommend one thing to be restored completely. Obviously, the other non-recommended cuts are going to be on the table, as will so many other things, including transportation projects when we take up the CIP uh, as a full council. Uh, but appreciate the comments. And uh, we are in a, you know, significant time. I think this is, you know, you know it, it's really unprecedented in the sense that uh, the culmination of cost increases, need, uh, obviously the impacts of the pandemic, uh, things, needs that were, that existed prior to the pandemic, right? You know, a lot of these projects that we're talking, we're not talking about new things here. We're talking about things that, where the need has been there for, for years. So. A uh, lot to work on, but I'm, I'm confident I share the optimism that we will figure out something that uh, does the best we can and we'll come to it together. Um, any more comments from staff? Okay, with that, we're adjourned. Thank you.